Thank you, Emily. Emily Lai from, from Pearson. Um, I want to turn to a couple of themes. Um, uh, the first, I mentioned up front that we're, we are uh, unabashedly vendor inclusive in the Empirical Educator Project. Um, uh, Pearson has been uh, uh, very engaged in, in trying to be a good contributor uh, from the start, so I wanted to talk about that. Uh, we have some good examples to talk about, but also I think um, we um, we want, there are some interesting, there's an interesting case study here about the challenges of contribution and the challenges of wrapping up um, a contribution, whether it's uh, from a vendor or from anyone else, into a, a package that can be transferred from one university context to another or one faculty context to another so that it's adoptable, right? This is, this is essentially the challenge of social, or one of the challenges of socially empirical education. How do we make something useful um, so that uh, um, people everywhere can make it work uh, in a non-cookie cutter way? So I want to first go back, Emily, to uh, the first summit uh, in which uh, your colleague uh, made a generous offer, um, there were two projects that you wanted to uh, offer up to the EEP network. Um, one uh, was a contribution that Pearson had already made uh, to the public. You had created these action, uh, sorry, the learning design uh, cards, I think you call them. Um, I think of them as rubrics. Um, and the other was a, pro a prospective project, which was uh, to create an action research toolkit for faculty. Um, uh, and you were looking for university partners to take, to work on both of those and make them, um, uh, in one case, adapt something that you built for Pearson, and in the other case, um, design them for faculty. Um, I want to take a moment and just talk for a minute about that first project because I think it's, even though it's not what we're going to talk about primarily, I think it's wonderful and people should know about it. So could you tell us a little bit about the learning design cards which are available today under a Creative Commons license on the Pearson website? Sure. So um, I wasn't here at the summit last year. My colleague Kate Edwards was here and I wasn't actually part of that original work on the learning design cards, but I'll share what, what I'm able, what, what, I, what I know about that work. So uh, Pearson had previously created what we call the learning design principles. Mm -hmm. And these are <clears throat> principles uh, of, of learning science. So they are uh, syntheses of research on learning science topics. There are about 45 of them. Um, and we, as you said, we released them in 2016 under a Creative Commons license. They're on the Pearson website. And they're meant to provide sort of um, short, accessible, uh, reliable uh, resources for learning designers. So that, that, those are the learning design principles. Um, and they were, how are you using them inside Pearson today? Well, in, inside Pearson, we use them all the time with product teams. So they sort of encapsulate what we know about learning science as, as it pertains to specific uh, principles of, of <clears throat> uh, that people can use when they're, you know, in the process of designing and developing products. So we frequently uh, provide suggestions to product teams or point product teams to them when they're trying to embed those learning science principles into their products. Okay. So, so just um, my personal soapbox on this one is these are really interesting. They are designed for a very specific context that is not a university context, but there's a lot of knowledge and research that's built into them. And it would be really interesting to, to, to take that and adopt uh, and adapt for a university context. So I just want to make sure that you know they're out there and they are Creative Commons licensed. So. Let's turn to the other project, uh, the Action Research Toolkit. Um, uh, Pearson had offered to the network, hey, we'd like to develop this. Anyone out there want to come and play? Um, a couple of you uh, had expressed some interest for logistical reasons, all of the reasons that make it difficult uh, to make collaborative projects work. We just were never able to get that to happen. So you all decided 
you know what, we're going to do this anyway. And you recruited your own um, set of volunteer schools, which is fantastic. Thank you for doing that. And um, you also uh, refocused the project a little bit. Can you tell us a little bit about um, how you thought about the scope and why you decided to narrow the scope? Sure, so we were really inspired by, by what the EEP was trying to do. And initially, we had this idea that we wanted to build a toolkit to help educators carry out their own uh, you know, rigorous efficacy studies in the classroom. Uh, but as a result of a bunch of feedback that we received last year on our efficacy reports and also feedback that we collected from attendees to the uh, 2018 Festival of Learning, which was held in London, what we heard from, from educators actually was that something like uh, an action research toolkit would be, would be more useful. So less about you know, highly controlled research designs and more about kind of pragmatic inquiry. So, um, so action research is sort of uh, reflective problem solving around teaching and learning challenges within communities of practice. So at that point, we sort of reconceptualized what we were trying to do away from kind of rigorous, uh, you know, efficacy research toolkits and more towards this action research um, set of resources. And then even within that, it, you, you chose um, uh, a, a focus, not, not just an action research toolkit in general, but as you thought about developing a, a, a workshop to engage with faculty, you chose uh, to focus your discussion around action research on solving a specific problem. Right, so when we convened participants, we did this in Phoenix in February, we convened uh, 12 faculty members from area institutions which represented a mix of, of public and private and community colleges and we had full-time, we had adjunct faculty, we had a bunch of different disciplines. And so we convened this full-day workshop where we did uh, sort of a design thinking workshop, which is just a process for kind of problem-solving ill-structured problems by focusing on the problem and in trying to understand the context better. So the goal there was really to understand the needs uh, and the perspectives of the faculty. And for the purposes of the workshop, we focused them on this topic of instructional relevance, which I think Marcia had brought up. And instructional relevance, uh, we, we chose that topic because in our conversations with faculty and with learners, it repeatedly comes up as this theme uh, that, that, people, that people struggle with. So instructional relevance really just refers to kind of attributes of the learning experience that allow learners to connect whatever they're learning in the classroom to something that they may be experiencing outside of the classroom. So to their, apply something in the classroom to their regular life or perhaps connecting it to their future career. Um, and how did you go about picking the faculty who ended up in the room? You said a little bit about that, but tell us a little bit more. Give us a little flavor of uh, the, the personalities and their experiences and so on. So we have an educational research design team, which is part of Pearson, and it maintains networks of faculty. Uh, so they had you know, deep connections within the Phoenix area because many of the folks on that team are actually in the Phoenix area. Um, so that's how we recruited participants. And um, the participants that we had really ran the full gamut in terms of their kind of prior experience with anything like action research or education research. Um, we had you know, one professor who was describing how he's currently working on an NIH grant uh, where he's gonna do a randomized control trial to study the effects of interleaving and spaced practice on his students learning. So he was sort of at the, you know, the, the, to the top end of that continuum. And you know, all the way down to people who, even after multiple discussions about action research, still kind of thought about it in terms of um, you know, course evaluations that you might administer at the end of the course. So there were, there were people with sort of all levels of prior experience uh, in terms of action research. And what was the spread in terms of disciplines and types of institutions? We have about 75% were from uh, public uh, four-year universities. Uh, the disciplines that, that they covered were, were engineering, uh, the health sciences, um, education, business, and political science. And what, do you, what did you learn coming out of that workshop in terms of the design of your eventual project? Um, it was really a great, it was a great experience and subsequent to the workshop we also kind of followed up with some, with some surveys and then some smaller focus groups just to kind of dig a little deeper into some of the themes that had come out of the workshop. But kind of taking a step back and looking at all of the evidence across all of those activities, 
what we found is that the faculty that we spoke to really do have this continuous improvement orientation about them. Many of them are already engaged in these kind of cycles of reflective inquiry, something like an action research cycle. Um, they tend to focus uh, a lot of their attention in that activity on what we, we talked about as the sort of preparation stage and the implementation stage. So in the preparation stage, we talked about, you know, this is where you're kind of thinking about what is the question you're trying to answer, or what's the teaching and learning challenge you're trying to solve, and articulating that, and selecting some sort of strategy or technique or intervention that you're going to try. That's the thing you're going to try to do differently in the classroom. Um, and then the implementation is when you're actually doing that in the classroom and you're sort of monitoring how things are going in real time. So they tended to focus on those two stages a lot and they didn't focus as much on the evaluation stage, which as we described it to them was the part where you're sort of taking stock afterwards and saying, okay, how did that go? Did it work? How do I know that? Why or why not? Um, and so they did a little bit of that, but they were sort of more, they took more of an intuitive approach rather than kind of an empirical approach. They relied on a lot of anecdotal evidence they were collecting from students and from their TAs about whether things had worked well. Um, and so that's kind of how they're, they're approaching things currently. In terms of their pain points, we were trying to really understand, you know, what is it that would, that sort of prevents you from engaging in action research more now? And the things that they mentioned are that in general, they find education research, particularly what's published in academic peer review journals, to be pretty inaccessible to them. Um, they say, we don't have time to read these articles. Um, I just want to know, you know, what do I need to do? Just tell me what I need to do. Um, they really want to look to their colleagues, especially it, within the same discipline, to understand what's working well for their colleagues. Um, they don't feel particularly incentivized to engage in action research uh, because from an institutional perspective, it may not be rewarded in terms of, of tenure. Um, and they don't have time, or at least they don't have enough time to regularly connect with their colleagues in the discipline, even just to chat about what, what are you doing when you teach this topic? How do you approach it in your classroom? What's a good activity for doing this? Um, so many of them said they, you know, colleagues teaching the same, you know, different sections of the same course don't even necessarily have an opportunity to talk to one another during the semester and, and connect on, a, on a, a particular approach to teaching that content. So I was really shocked by that. I thought that was really eye-opening. So if, if I'm, let me, tell me if I'm summarizing this accurately. You've got faculty that pretty uniformly expressed a strong intrinsic motivation. Um, they maybe had some weaknesses or some blind spots in terms of their methods, but they overall, they, they were pretty good. Um, they had some really strong disincentives structurally around them. Um, and um, uh, some of them were sort of active and some of them were just barriers. Um, and so now you're looking at creating an asset that is going to help them in that context. Well, except that it's a variety of contexts, right? Because you've got instructors in different disciplines and different levels of sophistication in terms of their research capacities and so on. So. What are you, what's your current thinking on what you can do for them and how far you can help them and what the package could look like? So we're still kind of exploring some of those ideas and figuring out what, what direction we want to go. But it seemed like the barriers that, that they mentioned were <clears throat> not understand, needing some sort of access to some sort of succinct, accessible, summaries of research or theories that they can just pick up and use. And if there are examples from within their same discipline, all the better. There was a need around um, helping to navigate the process of action research, including things like understanding how to navigate IRB processes. So just kind of lowering the barriers to participating in that type of research and having just someone kind of walk you through the steps. Um, and then, you know, other people talked about um, uh, resources. So, you know, if I had if I had a TA, for example, if I had a, a research assistant who could help me do some of these things, if I had funding for that sort of thing, 
then that might allow me to make this a reality. If I had help writing up a manuscript for publication, that might help. So there seem to be some you know, different needs that by you know, combining resources together, you could bring some of these folks kind of over the threshold from where this is something that's not really doable now, but you could, if you, you know, gave them a package of resources, you could make it doable for them. So that's kind of what we're trying to explore. Again, our next step is really just to kind of cast a wider net in terms of faculty, get a more diverse group, and try to validate um, some of the problems. So we kind of ended up articulating these problem statements that we thought represented what they were saying they really needed. And so our next step is to try to validate those with a larger sample. And how can the people in this room potentially help you with that next step? We'd love to get feedback from you on whether the problem statements we generated resonate with you. How is it similar where you are? How is it different? Um, and once we, you know, kind of have validated those, we'll start to try to narrow down our potential solution ideas and maybe even develop some kind of uh, low fidelity prototypes and get some rapid feedback and iterate. So we would love for, for participation in any of those next steps. All right. Thank you, Emily Lai.